Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Hub24 is on a mission to empower advisors to deliver better financial futures for their clients. They are dedicated to customer service excellence and delivering innovative product solutions that create value for advisors and their clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors rate them number one for overall satisfaction and why their managed portfolio solution has been rated best in market five years running. Hub24 believes nothing happens in isolation. So they're working together with advisors, licensees, and industry leaders to leverage their data and technology expertise to help solve key challenges in the delivery of financial advice so more Australians can access cost-effective advice. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and today I'm joined by Natalia Smith. Welcome. Hi, Fraser. Lovely to be here on your podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Now, let's give the listeners a very quick overview of you and your business at the moment. Um, True Wealth Advice. It's my business. It's a boutique financial advice practice. Um, we started back in 2010 um, in Melbourne, and we specialize in helping single women achieve a better life. Well, wow, fantastic. Well said. And uh, you definitely know who you look after, which we'll come back to. But before we go there, uh, tell us tell us about your journey. Where did it start for you? And uh, tell, us, tell us about coming to Australia. Yes, 2001, I arrived as a graduate. Um, my majors were languages and psychology. So I kind of didn't come from a traditional finance or accounting background. And at that time, uh, as a 21, 22 year old, just completely not knowing what to do, had to survive in a foreign country, didn't speak any language. So I kind of had to go and just door knock and really um, try to get a job and then try to understand how to actually manage my own cash flow. So financial planning, that was really my um, eye opener and um, it saved me, I suppose, from a lot of um, troubles. Yeah, fantastic. So, now, yeah. now, if I think about languages and psychology, obviously amazing, but well, things that we deal with all around the world, it's it's global. You had to learn English, uh, but also the psychology side. Let's go back to your university days uh, and where you're from. Let's, let's, go, let's, start, let's start back there. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm from Belarus, which is um, a small, very small country in Eastern Europe. It used to be part of the Soviet Union. So I was born there, and uh, I left when I was twenty-one. Wow! And so you went to you went to uni there. That's right. Yes, and I did um, double degree, and my um, degrees were English and German. That was sort of one part of it, and the second part was psychology. Yeah, interesting. Now, the now uh, amazing part of this whole conversation is that these, even though uh, you know, you might think at the time you weren't studying financial planning having conversations with clients and understanding their their language and understanding the psychology behind you know their habits and beliefs, I think is a massive part of what you do today. Absolutely. And I think that's partially why I decided to go into financial planning because it was such a great combination. And I'm really, um, I'm always curious about how people think and how we make our decisions when it comes to money. And yeah, so that's just, it's a really nice combination. Yeah. So tell me about your journey. You came here when you were 21. Uh, then, then what did you do? Um, I just, I was trying to get a job. So, you know, you, you, as a 21 year old, you just kind of get an, any job that you can, you know, get. And, and then a friend of mine was talking about uh, financial planning and how it was quite a popular uh, at that time, was a quite a new industry. And I thought, oh, you know, I'll, um, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's a great opportunity to, to learn about money management and also to, you know, to get started. So I found a, a small boutique financial planning firm, um, joined as an assistant, and they told me that I need to do my diploma in financial planning. So I got that, um, but at the same time, um, sort of realising that my degree in psychology and language is not really a degree in, in Australia. So I went back to, to uni and I did master's in business banking and finance at Monash. 
and that kind of gave me a broader, um, I guess, education um, on, you know, around finances and business, which was great. So, and then um, I've done my advanced deployment financial planning, joined another practice, and that's kind of how my career started. Yeah, now you started as a client services manager and then sort of worked your way into a power planning role. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so I started with a, a smaller practice and then um, IPAC at that time was quite a, a great um, business. Um, so that's when I, um, I guess, sort of I had more experience with a larger organisation um, power planning and also another smaller financial planning practice, really different types of clients, different types of businesses. And eventually in 2006, I think, I um, I saw an ad and it was ING Financial Planning. That's when they decided to have a brand new division uh, and that was a brand new financial planning arm of their business and they were recruiting uh, fresh um, people just out of uni or people that have never been financial advisors. And that was a great opportunity. And I I was lucky. Sean Dunn was my manager at that time. And I was lucky to get recruited and started as a financial advisor. Wonderful. Now, I'll go back to the IPAC conversation for those people who don't know IPAC. IPAC actually, actually had a, a very good process that they put in place, which was really around the, I think, one of the original client-centric, putting the client first, you know, that I asked them there their information, their details at the end of the conversation, not at the beginning. Uh, Talk to us about how that worked with what you'd learned in in your psychology degree and and how beneficial that part of your your, um, journey was. Yeah, so it it was a great place. And I think what I've learned from that place is that you really look at, as an advisor, you can either choose to be a finder, which is a person who's, you know, your traditional sales um, advisor, attract new class customers and you take them, you onboard them, um, sort of show them what you can do for them and how to take them from that goals-based advice approach on, on that journey. And then you introduce the minder who is another advisor that works in your um, business and they look after you as, as a client on, from an ongoing point of view and that was a really good separation and it allowed both advisors to do their job really well yeah many small businesses you are the both the finder and the minder obviously and 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 you have to be able to play both those roles in many ways um but as as i mentioned there with from ipac's point of view they had the two you then went to ing where you were essentially were you the minder or how did that work so ING? ing financial planning because it was a completely brand new business um that's when I got my financial planning training, so to speak, from a uh, more of a, um, I guess, institutional point of view. You do really uh, learn a lot. Um, and in a way, it, it was a great program. They sort of train you because they've only recruited new financial planners. So they've trained us. Um, it was probably, I don't know how many months of training, but it was just like A to Z and absolutely amazing program, training program. So it was fantastic. And at that time, um, they did obviously have their own products. So it was ING insurances, ING superannuation and investments. And that's how, you know, we were their distribution arm. Yep. Yep. And so then, uh, so then, where did you go after uh, after ING? And after ING, my one of my colleagues from ING, he got recruited to work at Macquarie Private Wealth in Sydney, and he mentioned to me that um, Melbourne office they were looking for financial advisors. So um, I got in touch with um, um, my manager at that time, Doug Weber. And so a few of us were recruited in that year. Um, the, we were all sort of financial planners and joined the existing team, which was Macquarie Private Wealth team. Yep. And how, how, what was that? What did that mean for the clients that you were looking after um, or the type of clients you were looking after? Was it a different demographic? Absolutely. It was a very different business, different demographic um, types of clients. Your ING was more of mums and dads and sort of really um, – you know, there was a lot of insurances and that's where I've learned the insurance side of the um, business, but also um, superannuation technical. It was really good from a technical point of view. You did really learn all the strategy um, side of things. And and Macquarie was very investment focused. Um, it, it was private wealth. It was dealing with high net worth individuals and really different style of clients. And then did, and was it from there that you decided to start your own business? That's right. In 2010, Yes. 
Tell us about that moment when you decided that you wanted to start your own. Well, at that time, there there were some bigger businesses, smaller businesses, but I felt only boutique businesses could um, have a client-centric, I guess, focus where you are truly independent. You could be truly independent. I mean, back in 2010, nobody probably was truly independent, but, you know, you were closer to um, a, a situation where you had a number of different products and strategies and, you know, anything that, um, you know, if you're a holistic advisor, that's where you want to be. So, and that's kind of, that was my decision to really join a, an existing group that um, we, we, we we shared our license. It was um, one financial services license that we were all under, but we still had, um, but we had our own businesses. It was more of a car under there for sale approach, corporate authorized representative. And that was great because it gave me this opportunity to actually have a holistic type of a business where I looked after clients' cash flow and also, you know, help them with their risk and insurances and also debt management, supremation, like, you know, all of those financial planning um areas that I I learned prior in my education and in my and had experience with I just felt like I just so wanted to help people from that point of view yep now I'm just going to um, jump around a little bit here I want to go back a little bit um, to your Macquarie days uh, you were there sort of around the the GFC time absolutely I joined in September and October I think was when the GFC actually hit. <laughs> right. So so you started in a, in a in a private wealth business where people are probably fairly heavily invested in the markets. Uh, you've then uh, you've joined that. You've I'm imagining you've been given a certain amount of clients to look after. Uh, GFC has hit. People are hitting the phones. Tell me about that moment. Uh, well, actually, going back to the clientele, um, the model at that time was that you bring your own clients. So it, it was a very interesting model. And I guess that's where um, I think, yeah, so it's it just, it was very interesting. It was very, um, um, I guess, you, you learn a lot. You learn a lot and you just learn as you go. You don't really have a manual, had to actually <laughs> be part of that team. And I suppose, and I was an outlier. Um, from that point of view, and now we talk about diversities, now we talk about obviously having women in, in that, you know, um, sitting around the um, table, but it, it was a very different environment. And I suppose that's where, um, you know, you're faced with so many challenges and you just have to survive. Yeah, now, yeah, a lot of challenges, I would imagine. You're, you've come in there, um, it's a fairly upbeat in, investment environment. Uh, did, were you having to speak to clients about their, their losses or were they, uh, was that there? Um, yeah, so I guess when I um, joined Macquarie, um, I guess the GFC was sort of happening. Like that's just yeah. – it, it, yeah. and it wasn't really just a one-off um, month or two months. It, it was going on for a long period of time. So really it did help in the way to start a conversation because a lot of my clients were amongst all of that sort of, um, I guess, turmoil and that really helped me to um, – to, to, to get clients because that was happening. It's just the t- timing was perfect in a way. But at the same time, obviously, there was a lot of panic. There was a lot of um, – and that's where, I guess, the, the psychology came into place because I did realise that, you know, it's much more than just investing or, you know, we've got so many different biases. We're driven by greed and fear and that's how you start those conversations with clients. You really show them, um, you know, you help them, to understand what drives their decisions. Yeah, this is really interesting. So you 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 know fell back on that what you'd learned previously with with your psychology psychology degree. Um, that that uh, that moment where you're going through that and you're, you're leaning into those difficult conversations with clients. What sort of tips or resilience tips around that could you sort of give the listeners around what you've learned from that time? Uh, well, I guess um, nothing is permanent. We know that. There will be the next day and it's just one step at a time that we need to take to uh, one small change accumulated will make a huge change and difference in the future. I guess from um, a client management, emotional management point of view, again, it's really it helps to to be humble. It helps to communicate and, and to open up discussions and listen. I think with any clients, when it comes to listening, um, when you show empathy and when you show that it is, you know, 
let's just not get emotional about it, but at the same time, you understand what drives their behavior, what emotions they're going through, and how we can actually work together without making those mistakes. It's not just about, okay, let's just sell your stocks because then I'll make a commission or a brokerage. So that's where I think the longer term um, relationship, that's when it comes into um, play. And, you know, you do learn that, you know, you're here for the longer term. So you you do make those relationships work for you. Yeah, definitely an interesting time, as you put it. Uh, but if we go back to now, the um, when, you, when you're starting your own business, you found a group that uh, everybody ran their own businesses under under a, a, a single or a joint license? That's right, yeah. So it was called Asset Plan and um, we all shared resources. We had some um, support um, license and, yeah, so it was a great sort of um, – for me, that was the first int- introduction to actually having your own financial services license and, um, yeah, so it, it just um, – and I think that kind of gave me that um, probably – opportunity to then obtain my own license and know that you know it is possible it's not as scary as others think it is yeah yeah exactly now with the masters in um, in business banking and finance tell me about putting your business plan together to start your own business how, how did you go? yes yeah well i'm a believer in getting professional advice myself so i do obviously engage mentors and business coaches throughout my business career i've had a lot of different people helping me and i think that's something that i always um, recommend is to really seek professional advice and engage the best yep and so you you had somebody help you put a plan together and, and, and kick off the business? Yeah, absolutely. So I had a lot of peers that um, have gone by themselves. They, they've had their own businesses and they, um, I guess that was a really good um, starting point where I listened, I I just learned from their mistakes and um, um, yeah, so put together a plan. And I guess, look, with um, a financial planning practice, it is, you either have a situation where it's just you and you're more of a consultant, you're more of a, you know, it's you. Or you do follow the path of actually having a business. You've got staff and sort of it's a different style, I suppose, of um, business. Yep. So at that time, so I joined Asset Plan in 2010. I I got married, I started the business, I had my first child, I bought a house and it was like, wow, in two years <laughs> – all of that. It was just a lot. So at that point, I kind of had to realize, am I going to have a, um, a lifestyle business where, you know, you do look after a small amount of clients and it's very high touch. It's very um, sort of you unique in the way and you don't really have too many staff to manage or do you grow your business and sort of work 80 hours a week? And I've seen both businesses. I've sort of have examples of friends doing both. And at that time, you know, having two kids, I sort of decided, you know, the first option is me. And that's what I've done since then. Wow. Amazing. So the, you're absolutely right. This sort of you, you do one or the other, you don't sort of sit in the middle and try and work out if you're doing both, because I think that's sort of a, a, a messy place to be. Um, so you started your business. Uh, was that when? It, did you call it True Wealth at the time? No. So it was Asset Plan Advisory because we were all part of that license. Yep. Yeah, and so okay. I've rebranded probably four years ago. Yeah, fantastic. And so with with the with the group, uh, tell how many how many other advisors in the group? We had seven advisors, and you know, sort of plus minus some some advisors left, some ad- advisors came on board. It was a good enough size. It was a it was really um, it was working at that time. Um, but it, like with any business, it, you get to a situation where. Um, you know, you sort of, you come to a conclusion that maybe there is something that needs to be done to change. Yep. yep. And so for, from that, from just a pure licensing point of view, were you on, did you become an, um, a responsible manager of that license at the time? No. And and so you were part of that license, but then you, you become a, a self-licensed later on? That's right. Yes. In 2017, I think, yep. I obtained my own FSL. That's right. Yep. And wonderful. So talk, talk to me about starting your own business. Did you understand and know exactly who your niche client was at the time? 
Um, when you just start, I guess you just talk to people about what you're doing. And a lot of my first clients were my friends, family. Um, well, I guess I don't really have any family here, so my husband's family. And you just um, you just talk, and you just have millions of coffees, and you just because you're so excited, and you know people feel it. They they want to help you, and they do. So I guess trust is one of those things that you know if they trust you, um, they you know that they, they'd like to to help you. And that's how it started, yeah. Yeah, so it started with just a few and, and slowly have grown over, over the years. You, you've never been one that wanted, a, you know, thousands of clients. Uh, it was about uh, providing holistic boutique um, planning advice, as you mentioned before, things like cash flow and, you know, really understanding their debt and risk and those sorts of things. How, how, did you, yeah. how did you decide that that was what you wanted to pr- provide? Um, I guess the biggest part of what I enjoy about being in the business is my relationships with clients and I do like to help them not just simplify their life, improve their life, but also transform. So I do have a lot of clients that go through a lot of complexities and something else that I did in 2007, around the time when I had my own license, I did Jim Stackpool's program, Cultivating Financial Advice, I think it's called, or Certainty Financial Advice. And part of that program was all about value-based pricing. So that was a really good starting point in terms of understanding how to price and how to work with your clients and add that value because it's not about, um, you know, at, at the very beginning of my business, it was all about how much farm you've got. And, you know, you charge a percentage of that farm and you generate and the more clients you have, the more farm you've got, the more money you've got in the bank. So, as a revenue, so I guess that's just a very different approach, and I think particularly now it it just it really worked for me. Um, so now I've got a, a very different structure, uh, pricing structure. We do um, have a you know a calculator that provides us with that kind of really um, v- looks at what value we're going to add to our clients. It's not about how much money they've got or you know how much in insurance commissions we're going to get from them. So that is a fantastic way of actually knowing that. What you, how you price your advice is based on the value you deliver to your clients and they stay with you for that particular purpose because they see that value. Wonderful. So the you really are looking at clients that are facing in or leaning into the complexities. Uh, and if, we're, if I go back to the find a minder type conversations, are you generally finding more clients or are you minding? So in my business, I have a – a team, so it's me as the mind uh, finder, I suppose. We do have an associate advisor, so she's more of a minder. And then we also have an administration person who does all the admin, um, software um, updates, all of that stuff. And also we have contractor power planners. Wonderful. So the, the, the business itself now has grown to the point where it's you plus another AR? Um, yes. Well, we're actually just in the process of actually getting that sorted. Excellent. Uh, so another another person who's going to be the AR uh, and, and an admin assistant. That's right. Tremendous. And um, so so t- talk to me a bit more about uh, what you learned with this values-based pricing, uh, how that's a different mindset to understanding their, their funds and their, and their management and how you then go about calculating. If you were to take on a new client today, sort of what's the process you'd run through? Yeah, so we, we look at um, – their current needs, what they need to have, but also what they want to have because those two are very different. Sometimes people think they need one thing, but actually, and they want something else. So we're we're really trying to understand where they're at financially. We are trying to understand how much value we can add them because there could be clients that we see, um, they come to us and they just sort of, they've got really different um, needs to what we can give them. So for example, we don't just do superannuation advice or just insurance advice, um, we really look at their complexity. For example, one of our typical clients is um, there might be a, a couple currently and so the husband has been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Um, he's been a, you know, he's a very successful um, ex- executive. Um, his wife is in this situation and they're obviously going through quite a lot of um emotional, uh, I guess, um, strain. And, and so the, they, they would like to ask to help them transition and particularly with, um, with uh, our female client to a place where she knows she's in control of her financial um, situation. She knows that she feels safe and secure. She's got enough money 
for her and for her children to last them throughout their lives. They know that they've got everything, all the fundamentals in place to position for a better future. So it is quite a lot because you're dealing with, obviously, um, a transformation, a transition from one situation to another. And there's a lot of uncertainty because we don't know when that is going to happen, but we know it is. it will happen at some point. So you're dealing with a lot of, obviously, emotions and also it's just, yeah, so that's where, but I feel the, the reward, what we actually receive as advisors when we work with those clients and at the end when we sort of finish our, I guess, the transformation, the, the reward we get, the the amount of, um, um, you know, what clients actually receive from all of that work is so significant and um, so that's what um, provides with that extra kind of uh I suppose happiness is as a as a business because we actually feel like we add value to clients and we help them to go through major life events. So if I try and simpl- simplify this down, that understanding of you know where they are emotionally right now, and, and I guess this comes back to you, you're you're telling me you're the you've done the psych, psychology degree. Uh, if I if I think about this as from a place of you your clients when they come in are very uncertain and unsure, they're um, maybe a bit stressed, uh, they've got some fear, and, and you're really looking at trying to find all these things that are not just their, you know, structural portfolio type things or, you know, like financial strategy things, demonstrating that understanding of where they're up to now and then looking at what the opposite might be for that, like, you know, from from, uncert- from certainty, uncertainty to, to certainty. certainty. Yeah, and then you're pricing based on that. So, correct. So, you do obviously look at, and we do have a 12 monthly engagement. So, you do look, what are you going to do over the next 12 months with these clients? You look at how many meetings. I guess that's one of the um, trickiest part of our profession is that currently we have to price, we have to disclose our price upfront. So, it is difficult sometimes to understand how much actually it will cost you uh, to serve this client. So, um, and what we do with our technology or our software, we do have in place where I do review all of our pricing and clients and cost, how much we've um, charged the client and what it actually costs us to, to serve the client. So we do look at that uh, and sort of try to improve it and, you know, always sort of be closer to the actual um, cost plus profit situation. But yeah, so at the very start, we do have our processes. We do have a phone call and we've got a discovery session. During the discovery session, we ask a lot of questions and then we proceed to the engagement meeting. And during our engagement meeting, we show um, our clients the path, what we're going to do for them, how we're going to do it, and also the outcomes um, that they could expect. And we disclose our pricing. So it is, um, but at the same time, our pricing could be a range. So it's not a an X, It's it could be, you know, sort of 10 to 20% range, just because sometimes it takes us more time or more, um, I guess, resources to actually complete our 12 monthly project and it might cost more. So clients are aware of that, they understand that, but it just helps us to kind of have that a bit of room if we need to, to charge more. Oh, I really, I'm, I'm quite uh, enjoying the word 12 month project. Uh, project management is often what um, a lot of you know exe- executives might understand, for example, they, they're running a project and it needs to be managed all the way through. Uh, phone call, I'm assuming a quick 15, 20 minute phone call just to say who we are. Uh, and, and I want to get to some other stuff that you're doing with regards to so, social media and branding later. But uh, tell me about the discovery meeting. How long does that go for and what, what are you getting into? Yeah, so we um, it usually goes for an hour, an hour and a half. And it is a, a meeting where we do ask a lot of questions. I guess probably a very traditional financial planning meeting. You know, we do talk about our client's balance sheet, you know, you've got income expenses, assets, liabilities, but then you also talk about their goals, their aspirations, their complexities, and we do um, delve into that quite a lot. We try to understand not just their complexities, for example, um, a health issue or, you know, an upcoming operation. We do talk about potentially, you know, their relationships with their family members. If it's a an estranged relationship, you know, all of those kind of little things that could potentially at some point have an impact on, on their life. Um, for example, one of our clients had to retire five years earlier because her parents refused to go to a nursing home, so she had to look after them. You know, all of those things. So we do try to understand um 
as much as possible about people um, in that discovery meeting. And at the same time, their level of understanding of the markets, level of understanding um, whether they've done any investing in the past, whether they've got any insurances, wills, you know, it's such a broad spectrum because we are such a holistic firm. Um, it is a very broad spectrum of questions that we go through. Cash flow, are they spenders? Are they, you know, all of those kind of discussions. And it's quite a lot to actually pack it all in, <laughs> in you know, in the 60-minute or 90-minute session. But it is very – we control the meeting. That's another thing I, I've learned throughout my um, career, <laughs> I guess. You have to control the meeting because people love talking and they can go, go off the tangent. So you try to bring them back into the actual what's what we need to know about them and that will help us to then provide them with a, you know, um, right – framework and pricing so much so much to unpack inside this discovery meeting uh, the and controlling the meeting is a very very important part um so many different impacts like you said on on a client's life a couple of quick questions one is do you charge for that meeting and and secondly what percentage of that meeting is factual you know this is how much money they've got in my super and how much is, is emotional okay so the next the second question Look, it is in terms of their financial situation, it is probably only 5% of our time because it's very straightforward. We do, um, I guess, look, sometimes people have more complex, um, I guess, financial, and sometimes they don't really know what they've got, even if they're very sophisticated people. So it, it's just, it's interesting how sometimes it, it, it really just really depends on their personality type as well. So, but we know that we can get the financial information from somewhere else. We also, what we do actually prior to our discovery meeting, we do have a type form questionnaire that they receive. And that questionnaire really, um, you know, it does have a lot of non-financial questions. Um, for example, what is your best decision you've made in your life? What is your worst decision? You know, all of those kind of really um, personality type questions. And yeah, so we know that we can get the financial side of things afterwards. So it's not really, and sometimes clients email it to us prior to the meeting too, um, but we we are very much focused on non-financial side of things in that first discovery uh, meeting. So what we do, because currently what's been happening, and we talk, we'll talk about it in, in a minute, but we are getting quite a lot of inquiries and it's been, I don't know, what, maybe it's because of COVID or something else, but we are, we're getting probably two to three inquiries a day. So because of that, um, we we started charging for our discovery meetings. It's just because obviously, yeah. Um, but again, look, it's just something we're going through currently. And as I said, pricing, it's number one, you know, topic always that comes up <laughs> in our conversations um, between ourselves and the team. So that's really, you know, important to get it right. I think um, I think a lot of advisors are charging for that discovery session now. Um, and it, it kind of, even though you're not practicing, there is a bit of therapy involved in, under, in, in that certainty or knowing what are those goals and hopes and dreams and aspirations and being able to dig deep and then allow clients to be able to see that or have that experience uh, does add value to them, um, even if even if they don't proceed. Do you also charge for the, the next part of the meeting, the, the, the uh, engagement meeting, or is that something that you absorb the cost of? No, we don't charge for those, no. So it's something that we, um, I guess, bears a cost. Um, and look, it is, again, it's just one of those questions we always talk about it. Um, I mean, the goal is to obviously help as many people as possible, but sometimes it's just not really, you know, we've got a few pro bono clients and um, it's it's extremely hard, particularly now knowing that we have to charge for what we do and um, the cost of advice has gone up significantly. It, it is, yes, one of the trickiest parts, yeah. Fair enough. So tell me through tell me through that engagement meeting process. You're obviously saying this is where you're at. These are the things that we can help you solve. These are the the, the problems, I guess, that we can help you solve. And, and I guess a lot of them are emotional as well as financial, better position. Talk to us through that meeting. How long does it go for? And and, and obviously you're presenting your your 
costs during that meeting? That's right. So the engagement meeting has three parts. Um, we've got a first part is um, our client's advice map. So we show them, and currently all of our meetings are on Zoom, so we do share our presentation. So they see their financial path, uh, sorry, financial map on, on their screen. And it is... Um, you know, we do talk about financial side of things, but also aspirations, you know, goals, uh, complexities. That's what forms and any any other matters that are relevant um, in their situation. It is a bit of a, a clarity kind of um, and, and a balance sheet because most people don't really see it in their life that way. So they know what's going on. Sometimes they don't know. But when you actually see it on the screen on one page and it's all your financial map, like your financial life, it is quite eye-opening and they're really, um, like even net worth, you know, that's that's just something that most people don't even understand that that's the concept, you know. <laughs> Um, so that's that's really good. So that's this first part. That second part is our advice path. So this is our process. We really um, show them the framework. This is what we're going to do for you. Our um, financial planning strategies that we're going to work um, with and what we're going to do for you, how we're going to do it, and the outcomes. It's very important that we always focus on the outcomes, what the clients are going to achieve uh, at the end of our work together. So that's and we were very focused on a 12 months project, yes. Um, so they've got that, again, clarity around our processes, how we do it. So it gives them that comfort. And, you know, I suppose and they understand what's involved in financial planning. Uh, so it is quite, is a, because it's a holistic approach as well. And so, and then we finish off with our letter of engagement that outlines everything we've discussed. It has a summary of what we've discussed and also our pricing. This is a really interesting topic on pricing because this is a good process, you know, visualize, show them the visual of the map, where they're going to be, uh, the, the, the pathway and the outcomes that they want to achieve, which is, you know, obviously the, the benefits or the, you know, the, the, the end game focusing on the end game, focusing on the end in mind, and then the, the letter of engagement, which goes through the fees. Do you find you have to explain people through that fee process or how, what's the conversation like when you get to the professional costs? Yes, yeah, so I guess they I always say that we um, are fee for service. We don't charge you based on how much money you've got. Um, we charge you based on the complexity of your situation and what we're going to do for you. And it is, that's the fee. And it is, in most cases, people are, look, it really depends. It depends if they've been advised previously or if they've never had any financial advice. So you've got this anchoring situation where if on, they've only engaged an accountant in the past and they've never had any professional advice or anyone helping them in the past, their expectations of how much it costs will be much lower than somebody who's been through the process, the know how it works. Um, so that's the, I guess, the, so we kind of really and try to understand where they're at on their journey. But yeah, so that's, we don't negotiate. We just say, this is our fee and um, we leave it with them to decide what they want to do. Yeah, this is our fee. And then, and then, and then silence, which is a, which is a standard, uh, you know, <laughs> idea of, you know, don't keep talking about it. Just say, this is our fee. We don't like, I think it's really good also that you, you mentioned that you don't back down. You don't sort of say, oh, well, but we can give you a discount or we can do these sort of things. It's just, it's. Yeah. It's very tempting. <laughs> Because, <laughs> you know, you just so so want to help people. And, you know, and I do have a lot of women that, you know, they're just not in a position to, to to have any, oh, look, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's sad. This, is a, really, this mm. is a really hard part about the job, you know, as a financial advisor, most financial advisors I know are, are in it because they love to help people. Uh, and sometimes sometimes you have to be able to walk away unable to help or not, not helping. Yes, and I hope this is something that I've been trying to, I guess, well, something I'm working on. How do we breach that gap? How do we actually have a solution out there for those women or anyone who, um, you know, is unable to pay the fee, but at the same time, they're still getting educated. They're still getting uh, all that information that they need to, to move to the next step. Yeah. Yeah, certainly a tough one in the current environment, but it, uh, let's hope let's hope that can be solved in the future. Um, talk, talk to me about some of the. Oh, let's go. Let's go back to your target market. You're mentioning women. Yep. Tell us. Uh, tell us about the the target market for you. 
Yeah, so it's um, my ideal client, my avatar is a 55-year-old um, single woman, widowed or divorced um, and just or just single. Professionals, we don't have one particular sector. We don't work just with medicos or just with lawyers. No, it's all about um, can we add value to their life? Can we improve their life and take them to the next level? And I think 55, it is um, 50 to 55, it is a great age because that's when we start thinking about our retirement. That's when we start thinking about what have we done, what have we achieved and what's next. So particularly as a single woman, and most of them have very different, um, I guess, situations, but at the same time, they all have that kind of need to get proper advice and to, yes, to just to know that what they're doing is right. And that's what I hear every time I have a conversation with a new prospect. I don't know if what I'm doing is right. I'd like someone to tell me. And that's what we do. That's really interesting. Uh, do do 50, you know, 50, 55 year old single women who have been divorced or widowed have specific issues that I wouldn't even be thinking about? <sighs> <laughs> they have a lot of um, questions, uh, that's for sure. And I guess a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of issues. Absolutely. And, and they could be different. They're dealing with potentially they're, de- they're like a sandwich generation. They've got your children you're dealing with, but also you've got your elderly parents you're dealing with. You're dealing with a lot of um, stress around what do you do? Um, how do you actually retire? Um, if you come a, from a, you know, a divorce situation, they're just they're just scared. They just because, for example, you know, again, it's a very uh, common case where traditionally women outsource all of the financial matters to their husbands, and so when their relationship breaks down, they realise that they there is a huge gap in their knowledge. Um, but it's not just the knowledge; it's also the confidence. Because if we're not doing something, we don't know what we don't know. And I guess that's when they really face that uncertainty they just feel lost they feel like they don't know what to do and if there's no one to trust no one to ask for help because finances you know it's a very private matter you don't just ask your friends about finances so you kind of like you realize that you need you just need more than what you've you know you've done over the last little while so I guess um what I see is the confidence it's it just lack of it um our job is to ensure that women feel safe and secure they feel in control of their finances and they've got that level of understanding that they can actually achieve financial independence so how do we do that and that's when we come in wow so your value proposition is from fear and uncertainty to confidence or safety or safe and confident it's good. I like the tagline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I might Brilliant. borrow it from you. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's all yours. It's all yours. Um, but uh, no, it's really interesting because that's obviously the value of the financial advice you're providing. It's not about, you know, whether you can put somebody in a better position by this much or that much. It's about that. It really is about that emotional um, that emotional growth or that um, how they, you know, how they walk down the street, I guess. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting, like one of our questions we ask is, what does money mean to you? And I had one woman, just only one, and she would say, like she said to me, everything. So I guess that's, you know, like that's where you try to understand, is this the client you'd like to work with? Um, what are your values, your personal values, and what do you value and what kind of clients you, you'd like to work with? Because if you are, if you have different values, different sort of, you start from a different starting point, it's not going to work. Um, so I guess when we um, see our prospects, we really try to understand, can we actually work with them? Now, so now that you now that you understand that uh, 50, 55 year old women who are single have been through divorce or or you know or, or even worse widowed, um, tell me about the the way that you you they find you. You mentioned you're getting two to three per week coming in. How do they find you? I mean, I know that you do a lot of uh, work with social media and, and and videos and things like that. Tell us about your sort of strategy of of making yourself known to those uh, to those avatars. Yeah, so I think, look, online, um, social media, um, that's really, um, it's just an amazing, I guess, like, uh, well, times we live in. Um, yes, it, it certainly, it helped us to to be known out there, to really have that message right and to attract the right clientele. Um, we, you know, in the past, we used to have relationships with advisors, sorry, with um, lawyers, accountants, and you know that still happens. That's still your traditional um, 
you know, centres of influence, but at the same time, the ability to actually reach out to your specific demographic and with very clever SEO and technology, it's so um, possible. And that's where I think, you know, there is a client out there for everyone. And, you know, it's all about understanding who is your avatar, how can you, what is your message and how do you find them? And I feel like now it's the best time to actually have that match because it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So the technology and the platforms are there to, to, you know, to find people. Mm -hmm. Um, Tell me, tell me about the content you're producing though and how you come up with that and and where that, where that inspiration comes from. Yeah. I guess, look, I always think about um, what do those women want to hear? And, you know, and it's interesting because sometimes it's not about the latest contribution rules. (laughs) They don't really, care about that as much it's all about you know it's all about trying to understand that segment that clientele what do they think what what do they care about what do they worry about and that's where I think this is where I guess we as a small practice we don't have that kind of data but there are there is a lot of data there and I'm sure there are a lot of businesses that know so much more about my clientele than me but They know, they've got all the data, what you search online, what you say to your friends online, it's all there. And and I guess um, it's a huge opportunity to to kind of, you know, to really streamline that and to make sure that, you know, you're heard. So from what we do, our content, I guess, yeah, it's how do we actually help those women and tell them what they need to hear, but at the same time what they want to hear. So it's, it's, it's an art. Oh, look, oh, and I don't have a degree in marketing, <laughs> but it's certainly, it's something that um, some advisors did really well, really well. Yep. Now, one of the things you've done really well, speaking of really well, is the videos that you produce, uh, which is not easy. Some people get really freaked out and upset and scared and, again, you know, fearful and, and nervous and the uncertainty of creating videos. Talk us through your journey in creating videos for, for, your, for your target market. Yes. Um, well, I guess just knowing that people like to see videos again when you, uh, and this is where you've got the trust, um, particularly on social media. You know, you don't know the person, but when you see them um, having that, you know, they they post their videos. There is that trust that is so much. I guess um, you know, it's it just bigger. Um, so from a trust point of view, it's fantastic, but also people get to know you, they get to know real you. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, it, it's all about that vulnerability and how, now it's, it's a big thing. We always try to say that, you know, it, it's just who do I trust? How do I actually choose a financial advisor? And I think being vulnerable, be, being open and transparent, um, that's one of those key messages that you can send to your clients and they they know that. They know that what you stand for and that's how they potentially get to to know you and they trust you. Yeah, visual, visual is such a big part of our trust and, and obviously we, we're doing a lot more online, which is a little bit takes a little bit more time to to gain, gain trust with somebody online, but visual is such a big part. I think the vulnerability and the authenticity of the videos that you create are, are incredible because that's the that's the point at which the client is up to in their life as well. They're also feeling vulnerable and, and as, as you mentioned earlier, that fear and uncertainty, but that vulnerability within themselves. So therefore, when they see it in you, they have a connection. Absolutely, yes. And I guess they are vulnerable, of course. And they're also, a lot of my clients, they, they feel that they, 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 they're very, um, they just don't want to tell a stranger their deepest concerns and fears. So you do need to have that relationship and that level of trust with your clients. So how do you get that? And I think it's really important to, um, yeah, to be authentic and to just, yeah, personally for me, I think that's what helps. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that that uh, that authenticity that shines through on your content then comes back to this that the, they get to know you, they then trust you, and then they want to pour their heart out to you. Uh, Natalia, thanks, thank you for sharing that part. Um, so from, from here, what what are the plans for you, for the business and yourself? What are you going to work? What are you working on in the future? Yes, I'd like to find that way of um, actually helping more women 
And just because unaffordability of advice is really, it's a big topic and how do we actually make it work for women? So that's my next project. Hopefully um, that's something that will happen in the future um, because the more women we help, the better the environment, the economy and, you know, everything else that is going on. We know so many women retire with very little super. Um, homelessness is uh, uh, up there as well. So it's really just helping because, you know, I, I guess I've got a very, um, you know, it's just some, my small team. We can only help so many clients. So how can we actually reach out to many more? And But also I think I'm very passionate about women in financial planning too um, because I think it's still, you know, our numbers are quite um, small. So how do we actually in, uh, improve that and how do we uh, make sure that women stay in financial planning and they get excited and they want to be financial advisors? So that's just something I'd love to um, to contribute my time to as well. Amazing. So having having a certain amount of clients that pay you to, to work and running a successful business and then being able to give back in, in certain ways to people and help in, in ways and having that, um, like you said, that pro bono type work, but, but also trying to do it at scale. 100%. And that's the big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's certainly one that uh, we haven't solved quickly, but uh, but you know keep keep we all have to keep chipping away at it. Uh, Natalia, thank you so much. How can people get hold of you and continue the conversation if they wanted to reach out? They can find me on social media. Surprise, surprise. Um, so Natalia Double L Smith, um, and the business name is True Wealth Advice and True Without the E. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Had fun. Mm-hmm.